The opening line of Rebecca is how a friend, repeating the famous words, encouraged me to read the book. Last night I dreamt I went to Mandalay again. Published in 1938, Rebecca was an instant success. The initial print run of 20,000 was quickly sold out. This was Daphne du Maurier's fifth novel and made her a household name aged just 31. Although some would say her family's fame may have influenced this outcome. The du Mauriers were a famous and wealthy family of actors and writers. Daphne's grandfather, George du Maurier's gothic novel Trilby, introduced the now legendary character Sven Gali to the canon. Her father, Gerald, was a stage actor so well known that du Maurier's cigarettes are named after him. Last night, I dreamt I went to Mandalay again. It seemed to me I stood by the iron gate leading to the drive, and for a while I could not enter, for the way was barred to me. Born in 1907 in Regent's Park, London, to actress Muriel de Maurier, née Beaumont, and the highly successful actor-manager Sir Gerald de Maurier. She was the second of three sisters and had a privileged upbringing in Hampstead. The family bought a holiday home in Cornwall in the 1920s, and that house, Ferryside at Bodenick, became Daphne's favourite haunt and a place of solitude and inspiration that enabled her head start early in her writing career. Mainly home educated by governesses, Daphne and her two sisters were extremely close, bound together in a world of the imagination, stories and fantasy. She had a close relationship with her volatile father and her feelings were uneasy around her mother. It was during family holidays at the Du Maurier country home in Bodnick by Fovey that she developed a lifelong passion for Cornwall, an area which provided the backdrop for many of her stories. Daphne's father was devoted and affectionate, but more so to Daphne. His longing for a son prompted her to dress like a boy, cut her hair short, and adopt an alter ego she named Eric Avon. Friends noticed that Gerald was constantly tactile with his second daughter. He couldn't keep his hands off her, observed one of the neighbors, the tennis star Bunny Austin. It was quite embarrassing at times. She found that such imaginative flights of fancy were met with encouragement from her theatrical family, rather than being frowned upon. Upon reaching puberty, however, Du Maurier put Eric aside. She later referred to this repressed side of herself as the boy in the box. When stage plays were performed, Daphne always played the male lead. She embodied her masculine ego, Eric, so much that by the age of 10, she decided she preferred life as Eric. 
She always played male-dominated sports like cricket and rugby and dressed in male clothing. What her father did not realize, and this was much more serious, was that Daphne was convinced she was a boy, wrote Margaret Forster in 1993. Sometimes, when she was alone, she opened the lid of the boy in the box up and let the phantom, who was neither boy or girl but disembodied spirit, dance in the evening when there was no one to see. This was a darker, more violent side, which she was determined to suppress. Part of this suppression was her sexuality. She believed she was really a boy, but had come into the world in the wrong body. In public, as an adult, she did her best to keep this masculine side of herself hidden. If only she'd been born a boy, her father once lamented in a poem he wrote for her. My very slender one, so feminine and fair, so fresh and sweet, so full of fun and womanly deceit. As she aged, Daphne told her friend Michael Thornton that she began to encourage inappropriate intimacies between her father and herself. We crossed the line, she admitted to him in 1965, and I allowed it. He treated me like all the others, as if I was an actress playing his love interest in one of his plays. She didn't specify what she meant exactly by cross the line, explains Michael, but everyone thought there was something deeply odd about their relationship, and incest became a recurrent theme in Daphne's thoughts and conversation for the rest of her life. In her teenage years, Daphne's attitude to her father changed dramatically when she became aware of his numerous affairs with young actresses. Her reaction was a mixture of jealousy and deep resentment at the betrayal of her mother. One of Gerald's many mistresses was the stage star Gertrude Lawrence, to whom Daphne was intensely hostile. She hated her, said Bunny Austin, calling her that bloody bitch. In 1925, just before her 18th birthday, she left England to attend finishing school at Camposena, a village outside of Paris, France. In stark contrast to her comfortable family home, her rooms at the school had no heat and no hot water. But these inconveniences were bearable because she was a stone's throw from Paris, which allowed her to make frequent trips into the ancient city to soak up the history. Young Daphne fell in love often and intensely. Aged 18, she began fantasizing in her diary about Mademoiselle Yvonne, her dark-haired, green-eyed, 30-year-old, unmarried headmistress. She loved Ferdy and was loved by her, wrote Forster. That summer, Yvonne invited her young student with her on a weeks-long spa getaway in the south of France. By August, Forster deduces, they were lovers, in every conceivable way. By the school year's end, Mademoiselle Yvonne was quietly fired and long gone. Clearly though, Du Maurier's memory of her did not fade. Daphne doted on her sister Angela, who didn't share Daphne's fine-boned and slender frame. She was curvaceous in a way that was unfashionable in the 1920s. She had brown hair and brown eyes, whereas Daphne had blonde wavy hair and was blue-eyed. 
Angela was three years older and at the age of 27 was quite desperate to get married. One day she called Daphne over to the window to look through her binoculars at the most attractive man going up and down the harbour. Daphne would later remember in Myself When Young. The man was Frederick Browning. It was Daphne he proposed to three months later. Angela never married. Angela du Maurier would eventually publish a dozen books, though her work was widely panned by the critics. She was so often unfavorably compared to Daphne that she cheekily titled her memoir, It's Only the Sister. In 1932, when Daphne was 25, Frederick came sailing into Fovey Harbor in his boat, Yggdrasil, to claim her as his bride. Meanwhile, her father's doting attention had turned oppressive. He was suspicious of any young man in whom she expressed an interest. When he became aware how serious the couple were, he broke down and wept. It's not fair, it's not fair, he cried over and over. Two years later, he died at the age of 61 from cancer of the colon. Afterwards, Daphne wrote an astonishingly candid biography of him, revealing personal aspects of her father's character, detailing his drinking and his frequent and extreme mood swings, in which his veneer of charm quickly peeled away to nastiness and violence. At Menabili, a life-size portrait of Gerald dominated the staircase. Daphne sometimes stood in front of it, gazing up at the likeness and murmuring gently to herself, Oh dee, oh dee. All three sisters had affairs with women throughout their lifetimes. But while Angela and Jean, the younger sister, accepted their sexualities and lived their lives accordingly, Daphne could not. She shared her father's oft-expressed repugnance for homosexuals, notes de Rosne. Still, Daphne was very often attracted to women, which could become quite obsessive. The hidden boy in the box was allowed out to see the light of day in 1947, when Du Maurier met and fell in love with Ellen Doubleday, the wife of her US publisher. Her feelings, however, were not reciprocated, but they opened up the gates for a later affair with Gertrude Lawrence, the actress with whom her father had been involved and whom Daphne had previously detested. An avid reader from early childhood, 
Du Maurier was especially fond of the works of Walter Scott, W. M. Thackeray, the Bronte sisters, and Oscar Wilde. In America, the book was, and often still is, considered to be a crude knockoff of Jane Eyre. Luckily, the Brontes were not around to sue, but there were contemporary novelists who also saw uncanny similarities between their work and Rebecca. First was Carolina Nabucco, the Brazilian writer of A Successoro. In 1941, she publicly accused de Moria of stealing her story, which centered on a dead first wife, this time named Alice. The New York Times Book Review wrote a lengthy, scathing piece headlined The Long Arm of Literary Coincidence, excoriating de Moria. So numerous are the parallels, it declared, that one may find them on almost each page. She knew everyone that mattered. Everyone loved her. Then, like all dreamers, I was possessed of a sudden the supernatural powers and passed like a spirit through the barrier before me. Another novel was titled Blind Windows by Edwina MacDonald, who filed charges and Daphne had to travel by ship to America to face legal action. Much like A Successoro and Jane Eyre too, the work features a young narrator who hastily marries a wealthy older man, moves into his manor filled with servants, and becomes increasingly jealous of his first wife, here, Della. But since no one could prove de Maurier ever read Blind Windows, the case was thrown out by a New York court. wound away in front of me, twisting and turning as it had always done. But as I advanced, I was aware that a change had come upon it. Nature had come into her own again, and little by little had encroached upon the drive with long, tenacious fingers. Daphne's sexuality was complicated even for herself to understand. The word transgender was not known until 1971. She didn't think her desire for women made her a lesbian and tried to resist her Venetian tendencies. Heterosexual sex was known in the family even more exotically as going to Cairo. Although she felt very much she should have been a male, she was nevertheless determined to be a woman committed to staying married to her husband. A little over a year into her marriage, she gave birth to her first child, a daughter named Tessa. Daphne had hoped for a boy, so the arrival of a girl was a source of disappointment. In March 1936, Dumoria sailed to Alexandria, Egypt, to join her husband at his new post. This was a deeply unhappy period in her life. She was not a typical army wife, being very antisocial, and she absolutely loathed Egypt. This, coupled with profound homesickness, hastened her decision to return to England in January 1937. The following year, she wrote Rebecca. On and on wound the poor thread that had once been our drive. And finally, there was Mandalay. Mandalay, secretive and silent. Time could not mar the perfect symmetry of those walls. One day, as Daphne was rummaging through some drawers in Tommy's desk, she found a bundle of letters tied up with ribbon. After reading them, she discovered he had been besotted with his former fiancée, Jan Ricardo, who was later to become the model for Rebecca. The writing was flowing and confident, unlike Daphne's own spidery scrawl. The letters gave her a sense of two people who had clearly been deeply in love. 
but Tommy's relationship with Jan, real name Jeanette Louisa Ricardo, was broken off by Jan herself, according to Daphne. In 1929, two announcements appeared in the Times. The first stated that the wedding of Major F. A. M. Browning and Miss Jan Ricardo will be postponed. The second and final publication stated that the marriage ceremony had been cancelled. Everything is kept just as Mrs. DeWinter liked it. Nothing has been altered since that last night. Jan was dark-haired and beautiful, with a reputation for wit and elegance. After poring over the entire bundle, Daphne became obsessed with the idea that her husband had been left devastated by the cancellation of their wedding. Why else would he have kept her letters for years afterwards? Jan's bold, sloping handwriting caught Daphne's imagination especially the curving capital letter R, which Hitchcock used to such effect to identify Rebecca's personal possessions in his film. On August 4, 1944, Jan Ricardo committed suicide by throwing herself in front of a train. She was only 39 and her baby daughter was only two years old. Six years earlier, she had actually read Rebecca and came to the realization that she was the model for Maxime de Winter's alluring and rather wicked first wife. He was always giving her expensive gifts, the whole year round. I keep her underwear on this side. She knew everyone that mattered. Everyone loved her. Rebecca made Daphne internationally famous and also a very wealthy woman. In 1943, she at last persuaded the Rashleys, an aristocratic Cornish family, to grant her a long lease on Menabilly, an historic estate on the south coast of Cornwall, England. At that stage, the house was virtually derelict, in whose grounds she had trespassed for years having fallen in love with it. She then proceeded to spend a great deal of money restoring the property, an expense many considered frivolous, given the wartime shortage of manpower and materials, as well as the fact that she was only renting. Daphne ignored such comments and carried on with the restoration. She remained at Menabilly for more than 25 years, until she was forced to leave in 1969, when her landlord decided he wanted to live there instead. Du Maurier then settled nearby at Kilmarth, a seaside home in the village of Parr. After the war, when her husband returned home, he and Daphne were virtually strangers. During his absence, Daphne had an affair with a Hertfordshire landowner, Henry Christopher Puxley, while Browning brought back from his travels a beautiful 23-year-old staff officer, Maureen Lushwitz, whom Daphne instantly believed and went on believing was her husband's mistress. They remained married, at least on paper, Back at Menabilly, his alcoholism and erratic driving became a local scandal, and he had both a mistress in Fovey, right under Daphne's nose, and two other girlfriends in London. In 1965, he died suddenly, collapsing in front of her from a blood clot that entered his heart.
At the age of 74, she suddenly found herself unable to write anymore. I think the imagination gene in my brain must have died, she told friend and confidant Michael Thornton. A black depression followed. For the first time in her life, she wrote despairing letters that alarmed her friends because this was so unlike her. Her severe depressive illness grew worse in her final years and she began refusing food. On Sunday, April the 16th, 1989, after six weeks of virtually no food, Daphne, by then a skeletal figure weighing just six stone, insisted on braving the elements and travelled to Pridmouth Beach in lashing rain and wind to where Rebecca's cottage had stood in her book. Then Daphne made a final visit to her beloved Mena Billy, still mourning the loss of her house of secrets. There could no longer be any doubt that she was willing and preparing herself for death. The next morning on the 19th of April 1989, her nurse Margaret Robertson took in her breakfast at 8.30 a.m. She found the light still on and Daphne's eye shade still in place across her eyes. She had died peacefully in her sleep. She was cremated and her ashes were scattered at Kilmarth. Moonlight can play odd tricks upon the fancy. And suddenly it seemed to me that light came from the windows. And then a cloud came upon the moon and hovered an instant like a dark hand before a face. The illusion went with it. I looked upon a desolate shell, with no whisper of the past about its staring walls. We can never go back to Mandalay again. Her novels are left to us as storehouses in which she deposited emotions, memories and fantasies. Their function was like a personal catharsis, but also here for us to feel what she felt. She left us emotional landscapes that can be entered at will. If you've read Rebecca, you have no doubt in your mind, wandered alongside Daphne through the haunted rooms of Mandalay. Do you think the dead come back and watch the living? No, I don't believe it. Sometimes. I wonder if she doesn't come back here to Mandalay. Watch you and Mr. De Winter together. You look tired. Why don't you stay here a while and rest? And listen to the sea. So soothing. Listen to it. Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed that presentation, and I hope it was a great introduction for those who are not familiar with Rebecca or Daphne de Moria, and for those who are familiar, I hope there was some information revealed that you didn't know about. By the way, the image on the screen is actually the image that I animated for the intro and the ending. Some of you may not know, and some of you might be just about to ask, where is Mandalay? Well, Mandalay doesn't exist. This image, I'm not sure whether it's Milton Hall, and we'll get to that in a minute, uh, where Rebecca visited as a childhood, and this is probably the inspiration for Mandalay. 
or whether this image is from the set of Rebecca. It could be. It could be even a wooden model. I'm not really sure. Yes, the, the scenes that I included from Rebecca of the ruined Mandalay after the fire, that looks very much like a wooden model. Uh, perhaps somebody out there knows a little bit more. So this is from a website called Opera Daily, Oprah Daily, however you would pronounce that. And here we see that Mandalay was inspired by Dumoria's childhood visits to Milton Hall. As a girl, Dumoria visited Milton Hall, a Georgian-style mansion in Cambridge, and was struck by its stateliness. According to her son, Dumoria first conceived of Rebecca's severe Miss Danvers while visiting Mrs. Danvers, I should say, while visiting Milton Hall. She saw this tall, dark housekeeper woman. They were always called Mrs., even if they weren't married, like Mrs. Hudson in Sherlock Holmes. Anyway, so da da da. And that's where she first saw this terribly sinister looking lady. I don't think she ever spoke to her. It was just a look that sunk in. <laughs> yes, I like that. Re Rebecca was also inspired by Dumoria's own house in Cornwall called Menabili, as we've already talked about and you've seen the images. And now we'll have a look at Milton Hall. And so here we have Milton Hall as explained on Wikipedia. And here we have the hall. Let's see if we can enlarge that. Not by very much. No. But anyway, there you go. No higher resolution available. Right. Well, there you go. That's what Daphne du Maurier, that is the house that inspired Mandalay. Well, after that disappointing Wikipedia image, I didn't want you to feel cheated, so I found a better image of Milton Hall on the internet, and here it is. A truly splendid house, isn't that lovely? Oh, I'd like to live there. Couldn't imagine doing the, the housework, though. I wouldn't mind doing the ride-on mower bit. That would be quite fun. And here we have a sneak peek at the interior, at least one of the rooms. And here I still have Rebecca. Actually, this edition had already been out a few decades before I bought it. This is the 1962 edition. Uh, and I got this in the late 80s. I'm not sure whether the friend that uh, told me about it gave me this book or whether I got it from the local bookshop. Uh, it was called Tease Bookshop, run by a lovely lady. It was open for many decades. I did hear some years ago that it had finally closed. Uh, she was getting on in years, but it was like a, a crooked, rickety rabbit warren of shelves and full of all these fantastic books. I bought many books from that place over the years and I still have my, my Rebecca. So I definitely encourage you to read Rebecca if you haven't already uh, read it. It's a fantastic book. Um, yeah, I can't praise it enough. Before I go, I just thought I'd share with you this old photo from the 1800s uh, showing my local haunt. So here we see this building here on the left is the Coach and Horses Hotel, named back then the Coach and Horses, and is still the Coach and Horses today. And across the road there where the, where the trees are, that's where T's Bookshop was. Of course, it's totally different back then. There's hardly anything there. It was quite built up in the 1980s. So after I'd finished being a bookworm, I would saunter across the road into the pub and uh, have some drinks and get into brawls. <laughs> That was about my life. That was the fun things happening in my life back then. <laughs> no, no. Fond memories. Fond memories of those days. Some fond memories, let's put it that way. Anyway, my dear friends, uh, I'm going to head off now. We're having a bit of a heat wave here. Oh, my brain is tired. Didn't sleep well. You know when it gets really hot? Had the air conditioning running, but the unit's not big enough to, to really infiltrate the whole apartment, so... I'm feeling a bit foggy today. We'll be better next time. Anyway, I do hope you enjoyed my presentation about Daphne de Maurier's life. Um, yeah, and until next time, take care and God bless. Bye-bye.